Welcome back to Fast Attack Slow Release. I'm your host, Nate Brown. Thanks for joining me. Sorry I've been away for so long. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday season. I thought we'd close out our season by answering some emails and giving some tips and advice. I picked out a few that I thought that were actually related to subjects that I wanted to do episodes on, but couldn't quite find a way to fill an entire episode's worth of time. So I'm, I'm grateful that, that these questions were sent in. So let's, uh, let's jump right in. First email is from Jared from Illinois. Jared says, my band has recently purchased a PA system with a digital mixer so we can have more control over our sound when we gig. I'm not really a sound guy, but so far things are going pretty well, except that we seem to be constantly fighting feedback. We have some EV mains, two subs, and four monitors. Any advice? So yeah, that's a good question. Um, Feedback is almost kind of like a rite of passage, I guess in a way. And by that I mean feedback is something that you learn from. I don't think you're going to find a live sound engineer with any speck of honesty who would tell you that they've never had a feedback issue. That's part of the gig is learning what the limits of your equipment is. But one thing that you should be mindful of, and this is one thing that everyone eventually learns to listen for, is that um, you know, stage volume is really, really important in live sound. Stage volume, um, I mean, that's exactly what it sounds like. It's the volume of the sound levels on stage versus the main PA that's playing out to the audience. You've got four monitors on stage. I would almost argue that that's probably too much for small to mid-sized venues. I know everyone wants their own mix. I mean, the drummer definitely needs a monitor. But when you're in smaller clubs, like you've really got to be mindful of that stage volume. So if you're going to have four monitors on stage, you got to turn them way down. Um, basically, what happens with feedback is you know, as you increase the gain of your microphone, a lot of people think gain is volume, by the way. It's not. It's sensitivity. So every time you increase the gain on that microphone, that microphone preamp, what you're doing is you're increasing that microphone's sensitivity. You're allowing it to hear more and more things. So as you turn that up, your microphone starts listening for more and more subtle things. The flip side to that is if your stage volume is out of control and your monitors are pumping way too hot, whether that's because of the amp setting or because you know you've got your aux master cranked, whatever it is, your speaker, your microphone's starting to pick up teeny tiny little frequencies, amplify those thousands of times, send it out the monitor, and then that's coming right back through the microphone. That's how you get that feedback. So, I mean, first step, mute the channel, obviously to kill the feedback, and then start working backwards. First of all, build your monitor f- mix with headphones so you at least kind of hear what's going on through that auxiliary send. And it's keep in mind it's also okay to say no. I know you're running sound for your own band, but you know the singer doesn't always need more me. Sometimes it's learning to tune your ear to your monitors. If your singer does need some more me, maybe instead of turning up the singer's vocal mic in the aux send, you turn the surrounding instrumentation that he's got going on or she has got going on down. Um, You know, that fader creep is something that happens a lot in live sound. It's totally natural. You know, one thing is sounding a little buried all of a sudden, so you creep that fader up. Now all of a sudden, you know, the guitar is too quiet, so you're pumping up the guitar or the percussion or whatever it is, and your mix gets gradually and more progressively loud throughout the evening. That's natural. It's avoidable, obviously, but it's natural. Some things that you can do to avoid that fader creep is like grouping certain things together. You know, if you run the drums on a on a group, then now, you know, it's a lot easier to just turn all the drums down if they're covering something up rather than bumping that one instrument up. The other thing um, to help you avoid feedback is also being mindful of your microphone placement. It matters not only in the studio, but very much in live sound as well. You, know, you should always know the, the pickup pattern of the microphone that you're using. If you're using something like an SM58 or an E835 from Sennheiser, you know, you know that those are cardioid pickup pattern microphones. Most vocal microphones are typically going to be cardioid, but there are also plenty of microphones 
like the Shure Beta 58 or the Sennheiser E965 that have a super cardioid pattern. And a super cardioid pattern is a little bit different. If you're unfamiliar with polar patterns, think of a cardioid pattern as a heart shape where the front of the microphone is the tip of the heart and the back of the microphone is kind of like the butt cheeks of the heart, for lack of a better word. Um, so those that cardioid cleft, we'll call it, is, you know, shows you that the, the microphone is rejecting from that area. So cardioid microphones reject from the back. They pick up on the front and the sides. Imagine taking that end of a microphone and just pushing it into an inflated balloon. That's kind of what a cardioid pickup pattern looks like. So in knowing that, the best place to put a, a monitor with a cardioid microphone is actually behind it. That doesn't seem to make sense at first because you think of a microphone and you think of pointing a speaker right at it. You know, you would think, oh, you know, like I'm, pump, I'm funneling way too much sound into that. But with a cardioid microphone, that's exactly where you want it. If you're dealing with a super cardioid mic, um, a common mistake is to leave that monitor behind the microphone. But a super cardioid microphone actually picks up more from the back and rejects more than what cardioid does from the sides. So, you know, a lot of mic a lot of cardio super cardioid mics, when you pick them up, they'll come with a little guide to kind of show you how to position that monitor. If you didn't get one of those or didn't see it or whatever, just be mindful that the super cardioid microphone is going to pick up from the rear. So if you move that about 45 degrees, so it, it's kind of shooting at you from a 45 degree angle, you're hitting that super cardioid pattern right in its null point now. You know, so careful monitor placement and careful microphone placement around that is huge. The other thing you want to make sure you're doing um, in kind of the same realm of things is make sure that, you know, your, your microphones are actually pointed at your source and not somewhere else. You know, things get kicked around on stage. If you're doing the old E609 j just draped over a guitar cabinet, sometimes the cord can twist and all of a sudden, you know, your microphone is facing out towards the stage instead of towards the amplifier. So, you know, mic placement is, is really important in not just avoiding feedback, but also making sure you get the best possible sound that you can get. You know, just because you're live doesn't mean that you can't prevent some amount of bleed. Being mindful of where your microphones are pointing are going to help you get a more isolated mix so that when you want to bring up a source, you're bringing up that source and not the things surrounding it. Does that make sense? It's a great question. I was hoping to get one of our live sound engineers on the show for this season to talk about that and share some tales from the road. But funny thing about live sound engineers is they're on the road a lot. So next season, I'm hoping to get one or more of our live sound engineers on the show to share some tips and stories and jokes. Hopefully teach us how to take like a good gas station shower or something like that touring is not glamorous all right next question eddie from new mexico asks i'm about to graduate from my school's audio program and about to start my internship do you have any tips for success thanks for writing in eddie congratulations on your pending graduation internships are both a fun and terrible scary time i don't mean terrible like it's miserable um there's this perception that interns deserve to be harassed. And, you know, you definitely, my first bit of advice would be do what you're asked as long as it's not something that seems deliberately degrading or against some of your core values. You know, there are, you definitely don't have to sacrifice who you are in order to get a job in the industry. Um, my first internship I didn't stick up for myself. I showed up and they just handed me a toothbrush and told me to go clean something. And while like I did it and the place looked great, it didn't get me a job at that studio. In fact, the studio wound up closing not that long after. Not only did it not get me a job, all it did was embarrass me and communicate a sense of worthlessness to me that I carried for multiple jobs throughout. Yes, it's a high stress environment, Yes, you're going to have to put up with some amount of garbage from people. But, you know, you should never feel as though you're being deliberately harassed. But going along with that, you will go a long way by making sure that you stay busy. Always have a broom in your hand or a polishing rag or a mop. Always be cleaning something. Your job as an internship is to make sure that that place is left better than when you walked in the door. 
the interns that wind up getting hired on as runners and eventually assistant engineers and then engineers are those who stay busy and not just looking busy, but actually being busy, making improvements, fixing cables, sweeping, mopping, doing stuff that, you know, you probably didn't imagine yourself doing at first, but things that are helpful to the end result. Um, when you do get sent in to a session to help out with the session, make sure that wherever the engineer goes, you're right there with them to help out. Um, I have had lots of interns who didn't wind up staying after their internship was over simply because I'm out setting up and tearing down cables while they're sitting in the control room talking, laughing, and having fun with the client. First of all, if you're in a studio and a session where as an intern you're even sitting in on a session, you should feel incredibly lucky. Most internships are coffee runs, and you don't start getting to sit in on sessions until you've proven yourself. Um, don't blow that experience and that favor by not working once you get in there. Yes, you're there to learn. That's the trade-off is you get to learn and you get to witness things. But you're going to learn a lot more following that engineer around and helping that engineer wrap cables and pick the engineer's brain about why they use this mic or, you know, what's this tip in Pro Tools than you're ever going to have sitting and chatting up with a client. And then to kind of go along with that is if you are sitting in a session, you had better not be inhibiting that session. If the engineer is waiting to address the client because you're telling them a story or because you're talking to the client, you are interning wrong. You should be quiet, focused. You're there to help the session go well. You're not there to bond with any clients. I don't care who they are. I don't care how big of a fan of whatever client it is. You are not there to fraternize with the client. You are there to make sure that the session which they are paying for goes smoothly. So as long as you're staying busy and showing eagerness and that you're happy to be there, you should do a great job and have an awesome internship. Congrats on graduating again. I hope your internship goes really well. Write back in and let us know how it goes. All right, moving on. For our last question for the day, Danielle from Minnesota writes, Hey, Nate. Love the show. I started listening for tips on how to get jobs in the music industry and loved the episode no one is going to lay the path out for you with Hayden Anderson. I really liked the microphone comparison that you did between the Aston Stealth and the Shure SM7B and was just wondering which of the two that you use for the podcast, if any. Well, that's a fun question. So both of those microphones are microphones that I own. We recorded that at my recording studio, and I own two Aston Stelts now and one short SM7B. Um, both are wonderful microphones, and you will not hear me say anything bad about either one. Lately, I've been leaning on the Stelts a bit more, mostly because I don't need to use a cloud lifter with the Aston Stealth. They have some built-in gain features that allow me to get the amount of gain that I need without having to purchase an additional piece of equipment. So the SM7 is wonderful at many, many things. It also has a pretty low output. So that translates into a lot of times needing to generate more gain than what the microphone and your preamp combined can create. And that's where these cloud lifters and various runoffs, spinoffs, I should say, come into play. Um, what they do is you send them phantom power and then they give you an extra 20 to however many dB a gain. The, the Stealth has a few different settings on it. Um, you can get, uh, it's pretty similar to an SM7 sound. It's also got settings on it that are tailor-made for guitars or different like vocal timbres as well. So I find it to be a really utilitarian microphone. I've used it on a lot of different sources, not just microphones, and I think it's really good. So recording the podcast, I typically use the Aston Stealth, and then if I'm at the studio in downtown Salt Lake City where I work, you know, I may be using one of my older preamps from um, a Yamaha PM1000 or like an Audient-type preamp, or, you know, if I'm on my smaller rig at home, I'm using an RME Babyface Pro, 
And oftentimes, if I'm going out and meeting with someone or doing something via phone call, I'll use uh, the Rode Rodecaster Pro. Um, those are great for tying in a phone line without having to do a bunch of patchwork. Either one is a great mic, and you're not going to go wrong buying either one. But if it helps you make a decision, it, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you're looking into a microphone right now. And if it helps you make a decision, check out our website. We're running a really great deal on Aston Stealths. So visit www.performanceaudio.com. Check out the Stealth. It's a really awesome mic, and you know, you're going to get a great deal on it from Performance Audio right now. That's all we got for today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening to season one of Fast Attack Slow Release. I've had a great time doing this. I've learned a lot about podcasting and interviewing and I've learned a lot from my guests. And it's been a really wonderful experience for me. Hopefully you've experienced something very similar. In the meantime, if you have any questions or would like to comment on a show you've heard, maybe have uh, some ideas for a topic that you'd like to hear us discuss in the next season, please feel free to email me. That's Nate, N-A-T-E, at performanceaudio.com. Uh, again, if you want to check out our deal on the Aston Stealths or deals on anything and shop with us and support us for publishing this podcast, we'd really appreciate it. You can visit us at www.performanceaudio.com. I hope everyone has a peaceful and wonderful or fantastic new year, whatever you're going for. I hope you get it. This has certainly been a wonderful year for me. I hope it has for you as well. I hope 2020 is even better for everyone. I'll talk to you soon.